Good afternoon, everyone. This is Neerav Shaw from the Maine CDC. Thank you all for joining. Governor Mills, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Before I ask Dr. Shaw for his update, um, I'd like to discuss some of the actions we decided to take over this past weekend in view of the significant increase in cases in hospitalizations and positivity rates in the last six, seven days in our state. Friday, we saw, saw 103 new cases of COVID-19, the highest single day increase in Maine since the beginning of the pandemic. Saturday saw 98 new cases and two more people have lost their lives to the virus. Maine's seven day positivity rate, while still lower than other states, doubled over the last week to 1.06%. This past weekend, the nation surpassed more than 9 million total cases of COVID-19 and more than 230,000 deaths. That's about four times the number of American soldiers who lost their lives during the entire Vietnam War. 230,000 people dead. In, a Washington, in the Washington Post over this weekend, Dr. Fauci, the nation's most revered uh, leading infectious disease expert said, quote, we're in for a whole lot of hurt. It's not a good situation. All the stars are aligned in the wrong place as you go into the fall and winter season with people congregating at home indoors. You could not possibly be positioned more poorly, end quote. Throughout this pandemic and throughout our gradual reopening process, we've constantly monitored the epidemiological data like case trends and hospitalization rates, as well as healthcare system readiness and capacity to inform all our decisions on lifting restrictions and stimulating our economy. Like sailors who used, used the night skies to navigate, navigate home, public health data has been our North Star guiding us through this pandemic. As Dr. Fauci said, the stars are aligned in the wrong place right now. The data is telling us our nation is off course. So to combat the recent rise in COVID-19 in Maine and to get us back on course here, we've made four, four changes. First, we've extended the Keep Maine Healthy program through December to promote prevention efforts at the local level. Second, we're returning to lower indoor gathering limits. Third, we've postponed bar and tasting room indoor reopenings for now. And fourth, we will remove New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut from the exempt status they enjoyed under our state's travel advisory. Let's talk about each of these in turn. To support Maine communities as they provide information and secure compliance with public health and safety measures, We've extended access to the $13 million in federal funds already set aside for towns and cities to implement their own COVID-19 prevention, education and protection plans. These plans include printing and posting COVID-19 information, installing fences, tape, signage for physical distancing in public spaces and closed streets, providing staff to limit crowds in front of public places like restaurants and purchasing and making available PPE and hand sanitizer at public locations. Plans may also support staff time for local code enforcement officer, town health officer, or other person designated to serve as the local contact for educating businesses on best practices and to follow up on public complaints and report public health violations to state officials if the complaints cannot be resolved locally. The state will reimburse eligible town and city expenses through December instead of ending them at the end of October. Two, reducing indoor gathering limits. While we certainly want to encourage voluntary compliance the spread of, to the to safety measures to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. We're also taking steps to reduce gatherings, which is which has always been a primary concern of all public health experts. So starting this Wednesday, November 4th, indoor gatherings will have no more than 50 people, regardless of the capacity of the establishment. This returns us to the protocol that was in effect throughout the summer and up until October 13th. 
The gathering limit and guidance for outdoor activities remains unchanged at 100 people. Now these are maximum numbers. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you should automatically think you're safe if you attend an indoor party or outdoor or other gathering with only 49 people or an outdoor gathering with 99 people instead of 100. It's not a cut and dried safety threshold. Let's be clear. Physical distancing and the use of face coverings is required for all gatherings, indoors and outdoors. And all gatherings pose a risk of transmission of this virus. All gatherings. With the holidays approaching, I understand the frustration for all of us who wanna spend time with family and friends. I have three brothers, a sister, five daughters, five grandchildren, all of whom I would love to see at the holidays but I don't want COVID-19 to be the uninvited guest at the party. I don't want one child to take that virus to school on Monday. I don't want one friend to take the virus to the local nursing home or assisted living place or to their workplace or to a prayer meeting or coffee hour at their church. I encourage you all to think creatively about how you'll spend time with your family over the holidays. My family like to hike and hunt and walk outdoors safely with Blaze Orange. We like safely distanced get togethers while we invite others to join virtually. Last week, my youngest grandchild turned two. Now you know how you wanna be there when a kid turns two, but rather than join in person as I normally would, we FaceTimed instead. <clears throat> I was desperate for a hug but then I was so happy when she tried to spoon feed me a piece of cake right through the camera. And I got to sing to her and see her happy face. It's not the same as getting together in person, but it can be quality time when you see how people are doing and making sure that they're safe. And that's what's most important right now. Postponing the reopening of bars and tasting rooms. Today we had anticipated reopening bars and tasting rooms to indoor seated service. But in light of the rapid rise of COVID-19 cases this week, <coughs> excuse me, we have postponed the reopening of bars and tasting rooms for indoor seated service until further notice. Scientific evidence suggests that the unique environment of bars, meaning the enclosed spaces where people gather with members outside their bubble, <coughs> pardon me, while talking loudly and not wearing face coverings, that these conditions elevate the risk of COVID-19 transmission for staff and guests alike. <coughs> Excuse me. I wanna take a second now to speak directly to the bars and tasting room owners and their staff. I am deeply sorry that we've had to take this move and postpone the reopening. I know you are ready and willing to follow public health guidance to keep everybody safe. We realize this decision is gonna cause further economic hardship. We don't take this action lightly, but the rapid rise in cases in such a short time means we cannot in good conscience proceed with this reopening. We have to balance public health with economic health every step of the way, although it's been so difficult and painful for so many businesses. Look, like most people in Maine, I too am deeply concerned about the effect of this pandemic on our economy. And my economic recovery committee is working hard to come up with new solutions and new ways of keeping businesses afloat. I want our economy to thrive. I want our businesses to survive and, I, and to thrive. And I want Maine people to stay alive. Bottom line is, however, what every reputable economist says you can't have a healthy economy without healthy people. You have to put people first. My administration will continue to do everything we can to support Maine's small businesses and the hardworking families through these ex extraordinary times. And we'll continue to ask Congress to do its job and provide critical financial relief for Maine businesses who have lost so much already. Then, <coughs> Excuse me. We've also adjusted the states that are exempt from Maine's quarantine or testing alternative for travel. We've been watching with some alarm 
other states' rapidly rising prevalence of the virus and positivity rates these last few weeks. In reviewing these metrics, we found that the prevalence of the virus has, has risen dramatically in Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. To reduce, the people, uh, to reduce the risk of people unknowingly contracting the virus and bringing it to Maine, we are saying that as of Wednesday, November 4th, people traveling from New York, New Jersey, or Connecticut are no longer exempt from Maine's quarantine or negative test requirement. Visitors coming from these states and Maine people returning from those states must either quarantine for 14 days or receive a negative COVID-19 test from a sample taken no longer than 72 hours prior to arriving in Maine and quarantining while awaiting results. New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts are still exempt from those requirements. Although we're closely evalu evaluating public health metrics in Massachusetts, and we may reinstate the quarantine or negative test requirement if its trends do not improve. Even with these updated travel protocols, I strongly recommend the people coming from New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts, especially during the upcoming holiday season, that they obtain a test in order to know before you go. Under the Department of Health and Human Services standing order, any person in Maine who feels they need a test with or without symptoms can get a test without an order from a primary care provider. You can find COVID-19 test sites via the Keep, Keep Maine Healthy website. Okay, I've heard some people say, we shouldn't care about this increase in cases and hospitalizations because the number of people, people affected in Maine is lower than other states. And we've been saying that all along. We're proud of the work you've done with us up to now to keep Maine one of the safest states in the nation. But you know, one life lost to COVID-19 is one too many. 148 people, people with families, friends, spouses, children, those people are gone. Every statistic has a story. It's not just a number on a page. Every loss has meant loved ones grieving. And you know you can survive COVID-19 and still be sick and in pain for weeks and months and not be able to breathe. Previously healthy people who have contracted COVID-19 have continued to experience symptoms long afterwards. Things like fatigue, brain fog, shortness of breath, chills, body aches, headaches, joint pain, chest pain, cough, lingering loss of taste and smell weeks and months after they first got sick. These are the so-called long haulers. They still don't have their lives back and it's nothing we want to invite somebody to, to endure. One woman named Emily told a newspaper recently that walking upstairs, she felt like she was running up a mountain. Thirdly, I wanna say Maine people are particularly vulnerable to this virus. Our population includes 22% of us who are over the age of 65. 42% with some degree of obesity, 33% with high blood pressure, 11% with diabetes, 11% with asthma, 6% with COPD or emphysema. These are underlying conditions that make many, many people in our state very vulnerable to this virus. Even if they were, that those statistics weren't true, locking vulnerable people up in their own homes will not prevent the virus from reaching them. Nursing homes and jails were not immune from the virus when it was brought in from employees who had been at large gatherings. We're all vulnerable. We cannot have a healthy economy, a healthy community without healthy people. We must control this virus. So in order to keep people safe, in order to keep schools open as much as possible, in order to keep our economy rolling, it's more important than ever before that each of us takes responsibility, that we avoid gatherings, that we stay six feet apart from other people, use hand sanitizer, get a flu shot, wear a face covering indoors and outdoors and wash our hands frequently. We can stem the, stem the tide of this virus, but it will take a team effort on the part of every main person. We're all in this together. 
Maine people know that this is a matter of fundamental matter of social and personal responsibility. Sort of like why you don't drive on the wrong side of a road. Sort of like putting your young child in a car seat, like wearing a coat in cold weather. Responsibility, basic safety measures. As Dr. Fauci said, all the stars are aligned in the wrong place as you go into the fall and winter season with people congregating at home indoors. You could not possibly be positioned more poorly. We worked together so hard this spring and summer and fall to ensure we could leave our home safely and get back to something of what life used to be like with many adjustments. This winter, let's adapt again to get ourselves in a better position so we can keep it that way because we're Maine. We know winter's coming, but we know it's time to hunker down, bunker in, and buckle up. If we don't, we're in for a whole lot of hurt. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Dr. Shaw. Thank you, Governor Mills. I'll go ahead and provide some public health updates as to where things stand. I'm joined today as well by Commissioner Jean Lambrew of Maine's Department of Health and Human Services and Commissioner Heather Johnson of Maine's Department of Economic and Community Development. After I walk through some of the epidemiological data, we'll take some questions from our colleagues in the media. And I'm saddened to begin my update on a note that is sadly starting to become more common. Maine CDC is reporting the death of another individual with COVID-19. She was a woman in her 80s from Androscoggin County, and her passing comes on the heels of another individual, a woman in her 90s from York County, for whom Maine CDC reported that death on Saturday. Their passings marked the 147th and 148th deaths of individuals with COVID-19 in Maine in recent days. We offer our deepest condolences to both of these women's friends, families, and communities during this time of grieving. Right now, there are 6,799 cases of COVID-19 statewide, an increase of 84 cases since yesterday. Of those, 6,039 are confirmed cases and 760 are probable cases. Right now in the state of Maine, 29 people are in the hospital with COVID-19, eight of whom are in the ICU and one of whom is on a ventilator. To put that number in perspective, just about two weeks ago, there were only nine people in the hospital in Maine with COVID-19, none of whom was either on, in the ICU or on a ventilator. 5,588 individuals have recovered and among our cases are 1,189 healthcare workers. As of this morning, of those 1,189 healthcare workers, 1,080 had been released from isolation and de deemed to be recovered according to the US CDC's guidelines. I'd like to take a second to provide some updates on outbreaks, both new and pending. Let's first start with some new outbreaks that Maine CDC has just opened up in the past 24 hours. We opened an investigation into the Deeper Life Assembly Church in Pittsfield after identifying and tracing 11 individuals to that house of worship. We've also opened up an outbreak investigation into the Midcoast Athletic Center in Warren in Knox County after we've detected five cases thought to be related to kids playing basketball at that location. And finally, just a few hours ago, Maine CDC opened an outbreak investigation into a nursing facility, the Sandy River Center in Farmington, after, detect, after being alerted by that facility of seven positive cases. Those cases were detected as part of the facility's universal frequent testing protocol. Those numbers, those seven cases are not included in today's case counts, but they will be reflected in tomorrow's case numbers. Next, some updates on open outbreak investigations that Maine CDC is conducting. At the Pat's Pizza location in the Old Port in Portland, we have now connected 22 cases to that facility. 
We are also aware of additional individuals whom we have been interviewing and believe we will associate with that outbreak in the coming day or two. Right now, that stands at 22, but that number is likely to increase. At Durgan Pines in York County, we're aware of a total of nine cases associated with that facility, seven of which are in residence, two of which are in staff. At Woodland Senior Living, we are now aware of 18 cases, 15 residents and three staff. And at the Brooks Pentecostal Church in Waldo County and the outbreak associated with that church, there remain a total of 60 cases. That number has not changed in a few days. And finally, at the Second Baptist Church in Callis, a total of 27 cases associated with that house of worship. Next, I'd like to talk about some of the most recent testing data. Governor Mills mentioned some of this just a moment ago. Our seven day positivity rate in Maine right now is 1.06%. To put that number in perspective, that is about double the seven day positivity rate of just two weeks ago. Indeed, Maine has not had a positivity rate of over one since around the end of July, roughly July 22nd. Since July 22nd or so, the positivity rate in Maine has regularly been below one. The fact that it is now tipped above one is a concerning sign. At the same time, our testing volume has reached a new high. Maine is currently conducting 590 PCR tests for every 100,000 people in Maine. That is a good sign and it helps us ensure that when new cases develop or when they reach new geographic areas, we have the infrastructure in place to detect those cases and work with them to try to limit the transmission. In short, the recent data demonstrate that we are experiencing community transmission across the state of Maine. Indeed, just in the past four days, we have had cases in all 16 of Maine's counties. This is deeply concerning from a disease control perspective because up until now, the bulk of cases in Maine were driven by focal outbreaks. But as we now see dis dispersed transmission across the state, it means that each and every one of us is going to have to do even more to do our part to reduce the number of new cases. That includes the things that Governor Mills just discussed, avoiding large gatherings, wearing a face covering, and maintaining at least six feet of physical distance between you and every other person around you. So with that, I will turn things over to our colleagues in the media. And the first question for the afternoon is to Charlie from the BDN. And again, we're joined this afternoon by not just Governor Mills, but Commissioner Lambrew and Commissioner Johnson for any questions. Uh, Charlie, go ahead. Yep, hi, Dr. Shaw, thank you. Um, uh, I, I wanted to ask about hospitalizations of people with COVID-19, it, um, it looks like those numbers are starting to tick up in the state. And um, I wanted to ask, do you know how the, the rate of people infected to hospitalizations is um, different now from uh, what it was like at the beginning of the pandemic? And, and, and why, why do you think that is? Like, is it less or more compared to the overall number of cases? Sure. Charlie, the overall hospitalized, hospitalization rate across the nation for individuals affected with COVID has gone down since March and April. That is largely driven by the comfort and experience and knowledge of healthcare providers in managing patients with COVID-19. Previously, at the beginning of the pandemic, when much less, much less was known about the treatment and the clinical course of people with covid Physicians, healthcare providers were more apt to, indiv to hospitalize individuals. But now with the experience and the, 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 the many months of clinical understanding of COVID, hospitalization rates have come down. That's a good thing. It means that more folks can be managed safely and productively at home. Also important to note that Maine's hospitalization rate, even though it has ticked upward, still remains thankfully among the lowest in the country. Given the number of, uh, of individuals that we have and our average age, that's a good sign. But 
as I noted, it's one that we're concerned about because it's something that could change and not change in a good direction. Um, and related, uh, the um, number of, I'm curious how the death rate, uh, if you think that, um, could, could that start climbing again? I mean, I, I spoke with one hospital administrator, administrator who thinks it will, uh, and, and do you think it'll go up at the same rate as it did, or, or have hospitals been making changes that make it easier to prevent COVID deaths? Yep. Um, so, Charlie, it's difficult to say. We are deeply concerned about that. And of course, we hope that the number of individuals who pass away with COVID-19 does not return to what we saw on a day-by-day -day basis back in March and April. That is unfortunately a possibility. It is one that we are, we, we are, we are concerned about, but this is all the more reason for folks to do some of the things that Governor Mills mentioned because by reducing your own likelihood of getting COVID-19, you reduce the likelihood of passing it on to others who may be at a higher rate or higher risk of death. Um, so we are concerned about that. And Charlie, just to give you the numbers really quickly, the hospitalized, going back to hospitalizations just for a second, the hospitalization rate in Maine is roughly two per 100,000 right now. The nationwide hospitalization is 13 per 100,000. That's 100,000 cases or population? Population. Okay. And that's the and current I thought, cumulative rate. Yeah. And just a real quick uh, uh, question from one of my colleagues. With the Pets Pizza outbreak, do you know how many of those cases are in employees? Um, I will. We will find out and make sure I get that to you ASAP. Okay. Thank you. going to turn next to Ann Burlian from the Ellsworth American. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. This is a question for Governor Mills from one of our readers. How is the federal response to COVID-19 affecting Maine's efforts to protect itself? Thank you for the question. How is the federal government's response? Well, I guess one of the problems is, and I'm not going to get political, but the, the federal government's response is not uniform. And <clears throat> while they have uh, at some point stepped up to the plate using the Defense Production Act uh, and required companies to manufacture things that are needed like PPE and testing uh, materials and the like, um, uh, many states have gone on their own and uh, been encouraged to do on their own things that might've been done more efficiently in a regional or national uh, way. So, um, I could spend a couple hours talking about that topic, but I won't. I was on a call the other day with uh, the weekly White House call, and I find those calls informative and helpful. Uh, and there, is been, there has been a lot of good information coming from Dr. Burks and Dr. Fauci and uh, Secretary Azar and others. Um, but I'm, just, I'm not going to engage in Monday morning quarterbacking with the federal government at this time. Thank you. Thanks, Governor. I'm going to turn now to Eric Russell at the Press Herald. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Um, I had a question about contact tracing. Um, you know, now that we're seeing much more community transmission as opposed to outbreak transmission, and now that the numbers are much higher, are you at all concerned about the ability of contact tracers to do their job effectively or having enough contact tracers to do the job? Sure, Eric. Um, we That has been something that as we saw this increase in cases coming down the pike, a couple of weeks ago, we started taking steps within the Department of Health and Human Services and Maine CDC to increase the team of individuals who are doing these case investigations and contact tracing. We've done so in three principal ways. The first is to redeploy staff within the agency and the department to work as contact tracers or case investigators and make sure they're trained so that we can maintain a healthy rotation of folks as, as we see the surge continue. The second way is increasing our hiring. We're continuing to interview and bring on more and more contact tracers and case investigators. And then third is keeping our, uh, keeping our relationships and the work that we're doing with volunteers who have been really helpful in this. We, again, as, as you've heard me talk about, we strongly suspected that this spike that we're now in the midst of was coming. And so we wanted to make sure we were taking steps to prepare for it. It is a challenge, make no mistake, 
the increase does pose challenges, but we want to make sure we're able to make that make sure we can continue keeping tabs on the new cases. Um, but it is definitely a challenge. Can you put a number on um, any of it in terms of the number of people who are doing the investigations, the number of people who are doing the contact tracing, any any kind of quanti quanti quantity? <laughs> yeah, um, I'll get you. We'll get you the the latest exact figures. But it's it's over or it's roughly a hundred individuals who are all told part of the team that investigates cases, generates the list of contacts, works with contact tracers to enter those in. But we're increasing that number as the number of new cases uh, comes into uh, comes up as well. Again, starting by redeploying the staff within the, the Department of Health and Human Services and from other areas of state government as well. We'll get you the latest numbers on what that force looks like right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna turn next to Patty White at Maine Public. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. I also had a question about contact investigators. Um, or contact tracers and case investigators. Can you tell us, I think the goal is for investigators to get in touch with people within 24 hours of receiving a positive result. Have they been able to, how often are they able to do that? And is that changing with this increase in cases? Sure, uh, Patty, the, the goal is, has actually been up until very recent, or it still is, it's actually for folks to, our case investigators, to get in touch with confirmed cases the day that the confirmed case learns of their diagnosis. Uh, but as we start, as we've seen an increase in number of cases, we are evaluating whether that goal may need to go from day of to within 24 hours. We're also looking at the same for contact tracing. Initially, the goal was for people to be notified if, if they were a close contact the day that we received their name from the confirmed case. But again, given the increased demands on that team, we're, we're seeing whether we may want to make that not the day of, but within the first 24 hours as well. It has definitely been a challenge given the increase in cases. It's a challenge that we anticipated. I don't know that any of us realized how quickly it would, how, how quickly we would go from 20 or 30 or 40 cases to 80, 90 or 100 cases. So that's what we're adjusting to right now. Um, it, it, it hopefully we'll be able to continue staying on top of it given the operational plan. That's certainly our goal. And how worried are you that we could get to a tipping point? I mean, we've heard about in other states where contact tracers can't keep up, and that's when it seems like things can really kind of get away. I mean, how close are we to that or not? It, it's difficult to say, Patty. Um, you know, that, that, that does require some crystal ball type of prognostications. I think our goal is to adjust the dial upward and down based on the two metrics that I mentioned, which is to say, are we able to get in touch with confirmed cases within 24 hours of the day that they received their diagnosis and then their contacts within 24 hours of being notified of them as being close contacts? That's going to be for us the marker as to when we need to dial up or dial down the number of people. I don't know that we've identified a specific tipping point, as you said, um, but it, it is a concern. Uh, there are also recommendations from the US CDC that are on the US CDC's website for how public health agencies across the country may best respond and triage cases as they are increase as cases are increasing. We're taking a look at those. Um, th those those involve essentially reorienting the case investigation process to focus on the newest chains of transmission to make sure we're not missing new outbreaks. Uh, and that's that's something that's on the US CDC's website and we're taking a closer look at. We've started talking about it, um, but right now we wanna make sure we try to focus on hiring more people or bringing on more people. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna turn next to Brooke Riley from ABC7. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, one quick question for you. What positivity rate or other criteria does the state need to reach to once again shut down businesses and or schools like they were back when this all began? I'll start and then Commissioner Lambrew, uh, if, if you wanna ch uh, chime in as well. You know, Brooke, I, I don't know that it, there is a, a formula that spits out an answer that says it's now time to move back to the stay at home type situation that we had in late March of this year. Much has changed, uh, of course, with, with the virus and our understanding of 
who is at risk and what mechanisms we can best control it. For example, we now have a much finer and deeper understanding of the value of face coverings relative to other measures. So our goal right now, or at least from a public health perspective, is to balance all of that evidence and take a look at what we now know, for example, with the utility of face coverings versus what we didn't back then. I don't think there's a specific threshold of positivity rates or numbers of new cases that will automatically precipitate changes. I think it's gonna be a mixture of where we, where we see things going, who we see as being affected, and then what other strategies are at our disposal that we can recommend first, rather than going to something like that. I'll only add that we also have been learning throughout this pandemic about what our more or less safe practices. So we have been very closely monitoring, for example, in-person learning in schools. And so far we're not seeing that schools, for example, are a source of significant transmission, which means that we may be able to maintain in-person learning longer than we might be able to, uh, to maintain other activities where we see greater risk of transmission. So we are not just looking at the measures, but also the protocols as we make recommendations to the governor about what comes next given changes in our underlying COVID, COVID prevalence. Thank you both. I'm gonna turn now to Evan Pop. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thank you. Um, my first question is for Governor Mills. Um, so Governor, you mentioned the need for federal aid um, from the government to help um, struggling mm -hmm. businesses and towns and people. Um, with the difficulty of the two parties in agreeing to a virus release package in the last couple months, um, do you have a sense of how the results of this election could impact the chances for a federal aid package? And uh, what would Maine's contingency plans be if there um, does end up being no more aid um, from Congress coming? Well, there are two very broad questions. Thank you, Evan. Um, firstly, there is a difference between the US Senate and the administration versus the House, as we've all read. Um, I don't know how to bridge that divide, except that the National Governors Association, uh, 50 governors, almost equal numbers of both parties, have constantly and energetically lobbied the United States Senate and the administration to step up to the plate and to provide uh, the necessary amount of stimulus funding for states and local businesses, um, either by continuing the PPP or something much broader, such as was uh, enacted by the House, back in May, um, I think the people, the people voting tomorrow and the people whose voices are being heard this week and every week are very anxious for a positive result from Washington. And it's been um, very frustrating not to have that positive result in recent weeks and months from the United States Senate and from the administration. Um, it's a frustration that I think is showing in, in some of the polling that we've read about um, I don't have an easy answer. I'm not in the Congress, not in the administration. Uh, your second question was, what, is, what happens if nothing happens? <clears throat> well, I think that uh, we, need, we all need to raise our voices. Every business that has lost profits, lost employees, every person who's lost their job, whether they're on unemployment or if their unemployment has run out or if they're unable to find other employment, that, that person should raise their voice as well and make sure that the people in Washington uh, hear us loud and clearly, um, not just tomorrow, but in the weeks and months to come. Make our voices heard, make them known. This is not a partisan issue when it comes right down to it. Democratic businesses have lost profits. Republican businesses have lost profits. Businesses who don't exhibit any politics, don't care about politics have lost in this uh, pandemic related recession. And so it's vital that we all speak up, that we all do our part and that we all lobby the United States Senate and the administration um, for immediate aid uh, as soon as possible uh, to help not only businesses, but help schools stay open, to help states and local governments uh, and to give us flexibility for the funds that have already been uh, uh, distributed, which by, by law right now, by treasury rule and December 30th, we're not allowed to carry them into the rest of the budget year. So those kinds of things have to happen. They just have to happen. And um, <laughs> what does the government do in addition to what it has done, um, aside from that, that lobbying effort um, of, of Congress, if those, if those relief funds don't end up coming? 
Well, we've done our uh, curtailment order based on the current projections. Uh, and as you know, the Revenue Forecasting Consensus Economic, Economic Forecasting Commission, the Revenue Forecasting Commission, they're meeting in November, December. They'll be reporting back their most up-to-date uh, for forecasts and projections based on what we know at that time. If Congress has taken no action at that time, I dare say the forecast will not be very good. It was not very good the end of July, although uh, we exceeded expectations in terms of revenues, um, August, September, probably October. Um, so we're pleasantly surprised with those, with those increased revenues, but um, businesses are still suffering. People are still suffering. These are American people who need aid from the American government. There's no question about it. Um, you know, how did the government step, step up to the plate during the, the big, the depression? How did they step up to the plate during the recession of 2008, 2009? Um, they did what they're supposed to do and they've got to do that again. But in the meantime, we're prepared. We're developing budget estimates based on what we know now, not on what we hope for, not on what we aspire to, not, not on what we think Congress must and should do, but on what, what information we have right now. Thank you, Governor. And then um, just a, a quick question um, for you, Dr. Shaw, um, and I apologize if you said something about this already, but um, for this latest outbreak, do we have enough um, data to determine whether we're on an exponential growth track? And if not, um, when would we you know, possibly know that by? Yep, um, it, that is a risk. It's something that I've, we've all been concerned about uh, both in the state of Maine as well as nationally. Um, really to, to really get a sense of where you are in any particular growth curve, it's easier to do it after the fact rather than during the fact. So exponential growth is typically something that we see. It can happen here something we're deeply concerned about, but whether we are currently experiencing that sort of rapid exponential expansion of cases, probably something we'll know after the fact. But we shouldn't get caught up in whether we are or are not in a phase of exponential growth. Suffice it to say, the expansion in the number of cases has been rapid, it's been recent, and it's deeply concerning. That's what everyone should be focused on, whether it's exponential or non-exponential or logarithmic or linear, whatever other terms there are, we should focus on the fact that it's rapid, recent, and deeply concerning because now we've seen it translate into hospitalizations as well as sadly deaths. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna turn now to Bob Evans at News Center. Good afternoon. You mentioned uh, the increase in testing earlier. With COVID-19 cases increasing in Maine, we wanna put that in perspective for our viewers. The president has said several times, if you test more, you will find more. So how much more testing is being done now compared to the increased cases, Dr. Shaw? Sure, Bob. That's something that we have, we, we always are keeping in mind in any type of public health situation, whether any particular increase or decrease is a function of more testing or less testing versus more transmission or less transmission. Based on what we've seen right now and the models that help us understand the interplay between testing and new cases, what we are seeing is being driven largely by community transmission. Some of it is a function of expanded testing, but the bulk of the explanation, the bulk of the power that explains what we are seeing is because of community transmission. Why do I say that? Well, one is that we take a look not just at the numbers, but the geographic disper dispersion of cases. As I mentioned now, just over the last four days, we've had new cases in all 16 of Maine counties. Testing, however, has not necessarily expanded that much into those counties. That's one factor. The other is we also take a look at the composition of who is being tested and how that squares with the increases in testing. The volume of testing that we've been seeing in Maine up until just a couple of days ago was relatively stable. It experienced a jump when another laboratory started reporting their tests to us, but they had been already testing all along. So the volume of testing that has been done in Maine has not changed appreciably, even though it looks like it on paper. So when you take all those factors into account, testing volumes have largely been the same, greater geographic dispersion of cases, plus the increase in positivity rates, and uh, all of that suggests 
that most of what's going on is the expansion in cases, not exactly more testing. Understood. Uh, another question for you, Dr. Shaw, then I have uh, one for the commissioners, uh, just a clarification. When you, can, uh, when you combine the increase in cases that are happening right now with election day, do you have concerns about uh, people voting tomorrow and what should people remember to be safe at the polls? I'm glad you raised that. What I recommend is that for anyone who has not yet voted and intends to vote tomorrow, live in person at the polls, they follow the guidelines and the various, uh, the, the various pieces of advice, some of which are available on the main CDC website, uh, some of which are available on the Secretary of State's website. They all accord with one another. And the basic principles are the same principles that we've, had to we've learned to live with now for the past several months which is to say, please make sure you've got a face covering on. Please make sure you're keeping as much physical distance as possible between you and everyone else around you. And if you're not feeling well, try to make sure you make special accommodations in some form or another. Voting can be done safely. When I voted in my town a couple of days ago, I was really, really surprised and, and, and pleasantly so by the way in which the, it's the city town hall had put up plexiglass and was keeping not just those who were there to vote safe, but those who were working the polls safe. Voting can be done safely and in person, so long as we follow these best practices. Understood. And a quick clarification from one of the commissioners. Um, with the restrictions that were announced for the bars over the weekend, uh, people are asking if it will also impact veterans organizations from opening to where they're private. So there are veterans organizations that are food establishments, which have been open since June when we did reopen food establishments. Those that are exclusively bars, exclusively have liquor license are in this category. For them, we put out guidance to make them behave or like operate like restaurants with seating, with distancing. But because of this recent upturn, plus the extra risk associated, with bars, they are indefinitely postponed. Okay, thank you. Turn now to Allison Ross at WMTW. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thanks so much for taking my question. So just one question for you and then one for the governor. So back to contact tracing, and you kind of touched on this earlier, but how accurate is contact tracing when we are dealing with household and now community transmission versus an outbreak and just how much more difficult is it? Sure. So, Allison, you know, the purpose of contact tracing, there, there are, well, when we when we receive word of a new case of, of COVID-19, we immediately ask two lines of inquiry. The first is where did they get the case from? Where did they get their COVID from? And then who might they have given it to? The contact tracing element answers the latter question. Who might they have given COVID to? And how quickly can we reach out to them to keep them safe so they don't they don't potentially offer it or pass it on to somebody else. We found that contact tracing is quite robust at that. Now, we, we, we work with people to remember everyone that they've been in contact with going back two days before they started having symptoms. And we then reach out to those folks to advise them to be in quarantine. But we can only go based on the best information that we've got. But I do think the strength of our contact tracing team is one of the reasons we've been we've had relatively favorable success in Maine. As case numbers go up, we are evaluating the possibility of having to triage, as I mentioned to Patty White a moment ago, to triage case investigations as well as contact tracing. Uh, and we'll see how the cases go to, and make decisions from there. Okay, and then just my final question here is for the governor. So. Governor Mills, we saw the number of cases rising over the past few days. We even held that emergency press conference on a Wednesday. So why now? Why now put in these new restrictions and the new travel exemptions? Um, I think you just answered the question. <laughs> the increase in numbers, uh, increase in hospitalizations, increase in uh, positivity rate. If you don't stop it, at this point, as I said before, it's kind of, it's pretty hard to put this evil genie back in the bottle. You can't say, well, let's wait and see if it continues to increase. It is increasing day to day. Um, you don't just, you don't just say, if I wait a little longer, it'll go away. 
You can't ignore it because it's real and people in every county of this state and every region of this state are getting sick. And even if they're not feeling sick, they are infecting others. We can't let this take any more lives of Maine people. We cannot let this make pe Maine people sick. We cannot allow this virus to take control of our lives, our schools, our businesses, how we do things. We just cannot let it take over our state. So by drawing back now, we prevent further spread in the coming days and weeks. And the sooner we do that, the better. I would love to- I guess just for- Go ahead. Oh, just for clarification. So I guess my question was why not sooner? Why not initially sooner. when we saw the spike? Well, we looked at it every day and um, we, we were talking about it late last week. Uh, and then over the weekend, we made these decisions. We kept looking for the trends and the, the trends were not, were not good. So you can say, Great. you know, there'll, there'll always be Monday, mo Monday morning quarterbacking about any decision we make. Well, they should have done it then. She should have done it later. She should have done it sooner. She should have done this and not that or that and not this. Um, that's to be expected. Um, this pandemic has no real playbook. We know that. We have to prepare for the unpredictable, prepare for the unexpected consequences of this pandemic and protect ourselves as best we can. Thank you. Right. And I'll turn now to Brian Sullivan at WABI. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, Governor Mills, I have a question for you um, about Massachusetts. Uh, Governor Baker made uh, an announcement, I think, th this afternoon. Uh, I think a curfew was put in place and a couple of similar uh, restrictions being sort of rolled back. Um, can you just talk a little bit about what's going on with Massachusetts? Would you consider something similar to what they've done and the decision to, I don't mean to use a double negative here, but not remove them from our exemption list um, with the other states that were removed. Thank you. I just saw that as well as reading it while, while we were talking that he's ordered a curfew for businesses, reducing the indoor gathering limit to 10, and that includes in people's homes, and he's tightening the face mask requirement, a mandate for anybody over the age of five to wear a face covering in public, whenever in public. Um, and it says that uh, he's imposed a curfew for everybody, a stay at home advisory from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. beginning this coming Friday morning. Beginning those, between those hours, residents should stay home with exceptions like going to work or going to the grocery store. That's really going back to where we were in March and April to a large extent. And I'm saddened that it's, it's uh, that Governor Baker, who's a friend of mine, has had to take those kinds of um, extraordinary measures but they're seeing, he's, it says, ninth consecutive day of new COVID cases exceeding 1,000 per day and a long predicted second surge. The number of virus related deaths in Massachusetts surpassed 10,000, 10,000. Well, it is my hope that the, that the measures we're taking now, the actions we're taking today and Wednesday will help reduce the spread, will help mitigate the spread of the virus in our state. The travel advisories that we've changed now um, will help reduce the spread of the virus from one state to another, including into Maine. We'll, we'll continue looking at Massachusetts' positivity rates, the case numbers per 100,000, and their hospitalization rates day by day to see if we ought to take further measures there. But well, we still, I, I and Dr. Shah and Commissioner Nat Lambert all advise people, we know there's a lot of travel between Maine people and Massachusetts for good reason. People are going to school there. People are teaching there. People are working there. People are going to hospitals there. They have great medical facilities in Boston and, and their, thereabouts. But for goodness sakes, please take every precaution. Don't stop at a gas station or a restaurant in Massachusetts. Wear a face covering everywhere you go. If you can stay in your car at all, if at all possible, stay in your car as much as possible. Don't get out, don't mingle with people in, in that state. And when you come back, and if you're staying there, you're coming back, get a test. Those tests are now readily available. Uh, and, uh, but out of an excess of caution, 
to set to help your families stay safe and your friends and neighbors, your church members, parishioners, work, fellow workers, co-workers, help them stay safe by getting a test. Massachusetts, it looks like it's on fire. Thank you, Governor. And Dr. Shaw, one for you, uh, if you don't mind. I know you've talked in the past a lot about when you can, uh, when and what you can glean from data. If you look two weeks uh, into the past, and I think you talked about our bubbles expanding and perhaps maybe uh, sadly bursting in some uh, uh, cases here, what can you tell us about what you saw that Mainers were doing two weeks ago that have led up to what's happened? You know, Brian, I, I don't know that it's something that I saw that Mainers were doing as such. Uh, the, the virus does what the virus does, and, and it, which is to say it spreads viciously and almost indiscriminately right now. I, I don't know that it's so much what Mainers were or were not doing. Uh, the virus has been spreading. And I think what, what we really see in the data is, is not so much that this was a gradual uptick, this was a very rapid, rapid expansion in the positivity rate, as well as the subsequent number of cases, now hospitalizations, and sadly, two deaths. That's what I see when I take a look back on the data. It's less about what, one, what, any, what any one group was or was not doing, and it's really just more about these epidemiological trends. So nothing that the contact tracing would have brought back any, any sort of common themes? No, in fact, what we, I mean, we, we have uncovered outbreaks that we've talked about at restaurants, houses of worship, uh, places of that nature, which we have detected. But increasingly, when we touch base with individuals for that first interview, increasingly on a day-to-day -day basis now, a smaller and smaller fraction of those individuals report association with any of the known outbreaks that we have. That's further evidence that what's happening is community transmission. It's not being driven by focal events, but rather dispersed interactions with one another. And I'm sorry, just one quick one for Commissioner Lambrou for the sports department. Uh, you have the outbreak with the, um, I think being linked to some kids playing basketball. Does this give you pause or does it do anything for a potential winter uh, sports season, which would be upcoming? So recently, the Maine Principals Association announced that it was going to delay the start of winter sports um, from November 16th to a date to be announced. I know that the principals, superintendents, school boards are all looking at hard at the options for when uh, winter sports does begin. We also are looking at individual sports guidance for basketball and hockey and the other winter sports, as well as the different levels of competition. Um, we are looking hard at what's going on in different states and seeing some cause for concern. But when we do update our guidance for winter, we will number one, align school sports with community sports to make sure that those two sets of activities are, are being conducted in parallel. And number two, make sure that we're keeping both sets of sports, sports athletes, coaches, referees equally safe. So we're working hard on that. We. Um, we're hoping to have that information soon. Thank you. Thank you. And turn now to Amy Brown. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, has the main CDC been made aware of anyone else that's been contacted by White House contact tracers after the large rallies here? Not to my knowledge. Okay. And my next question is kind of a compound question. Uh, first, starting with uh, questions from listeners who are asking about what is the latest on the types of masks that are best for the general public to wear, assuming that just having a scarf over your face is not sufficient? And whether uh, washing hands becomes and cleaning surfaces becomes more important as people are starting to head indoors. And then I wanna tag on to that, whether the case investigators, contact tracers are asking about mask use and if you're finding any trends there. So the, the, with respect to the best type of face coverings to use, the answer is any type of face covering that is designed for that purpose. There are now uh, myriad face coverings that are sold in every which uh, type of outlet. Governor Mills has got uh, an array of them. Um, any, anything that is specially designed for that purpose, that is to say it's got tight fitting ear loops, it's got multiple layers of fabric, that's really what you want to be wearing. A makeshift face covering, be it a scarf, a neck gaiter, 
those can leave too many uh, open spaces and allow the virus to go from what from from your from your mouth over to somebody else who may inhale it. Uh, you don't necessarily have to go and buy an expensive surgical quality mask at the drugstore. Any type of cloth based face covering, again, specifically designed for that purpose, not a makeshift type of thing. That's really where you want to be going. Um, in terms of trends that we have seen, we haven't seen exact trends. We, we, when, we, when we see outbreaks, that is when we start inquiring about face covering usage. And, and most recently with some of the outbreaks in houses of worship, uh, one of the concerning trends that we've seen is although mask coverings, uh, face coverings may have been recommended, they weren't required. So I think this is a good opportunity to remind everybody that no matter where you may be gathering, be it at a house of worship or any type of event, where there are folks there who are going to be there in close proximity for more than 15 minutes, that is an opportunity to make sure everybody is wearing a face covering that collectively reduces the likelihood of any transmission. So is that being followed with individual cases though, as you're seeing spread not connected to outbreaks? Are you seeing that more among people who are not wearing face coverings in public? We, we do know that, no, so the, the, the purpose of a face covering is predominantly to reduce your likelihood of transmitting COVID-19. There are some data, early data, to suggest that you can reduce your likelihood of acquiring COVID-19, but we haven't seen any stark trends in that. We know that from a population level, if everyone is wearing a face covering, it reduces your likelihood of passing it on, and that's really the magic of wearing a face covering. Okay, the other part of the compound question was about, uh, is there a need for more cleaning of surfaces and hand washing as people move inside? Um, hand washing remains important. Um, hand washing is really one of the ways that you can reduce the likelihood of accidentally touching your eye or your mouth and ingesting the virus. So hand washing remains important. For me, what I would recommend for folks is that they should be doing the normal household cleaning that they would otherwise be doing. That's the best way to reduce whatever likelihood there may be from surfaces. But if you're looking at the things you need to be doing to keep your family safe from COVID-19, the very, very top of the list is face coverings and avoiding crowds and maintaining physical distance. That's where we should be really focusing our efforts. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I'm going to turn now to David Singer at WGME. Hi, can you hear me, Dr. Shaw? Yep, go ahead, David. Okay, unmuted there. I have a question for you and then a question for the governor. I know you touched on this already, but I just want to get our viewers any more substantive information on what's happening with community transmission events. Can you say at all, typically or commonly, what kinds of environments or what circumstances that these community transmission cases are typically happening? Sure. Um, you know, David, what's insidious about community transmission is that it can happen just about anywhere in, in our lives where we come into contact with other individuals. Uh, now, all that being said, we are aware that certain activities, as Commissioner Lambrew noted a moment ago, certain activities pose a particularly high risk relative to other activities. Some are lower risk. What we've seen in terms of the places where individuals are acquiring COVID-19 or what we, what we believe that they are, are places where groups of people gather. For example, anywhere where a large group of individuals may be together for more than 15 minutes, that's an opportunity for COVID-19 to transmit. Earlier in the outbreak, we were principally concerned about public places, be they restaurants and others. We remain concerned about those. As the outbreak at Pat's Pizza shows, transmission in restaurants can happen. But as we go into colder months, we are finding an increasing number of people who report that their main source of interaction with others was at a small, friendly neighborhood, family type gathering. So as we go into the colder months, that's the area that I remain principally concerned about and where I'm asking folks to make sure they're wearing face coverings. Even if you're just going to your neighbor's place for a little while to spend some time indoors, wearing a face covering can really reduce the likelihood. But we've started seeing that type of family and friend gathering generate more and more cases across the state. My last question for the governor, and thank you for that. 
the resumption of these travel restrictions against certain travelers from the aforementioned states, is there going to be a more concerted and actualized effort to enforce those measures this time? Uh, Gov, sorry, Gov, you're, you're muted there. Thanks. Um, we, yeah, well, we are going to be making testing even more widely available. We are cautioning everybody who does travel to uh, not take these requirements lightly. In terms of specific enforcement, uh, that's one reason we beef, beefed up the Keep Healthy Maine program and uh, beefing up local compliance and education efforts. Um, I can't tell you how many people would, would email me or text me and say, I saw an out-of-state license plate back in June and July, and uh, people were getting stopped because they had out-of-state license plates. People are tuned into these requirements, tuned into the fact that you know more than 10,000 people in Massachusetts uh, have died, uh, have had deaths associated with COVID-19. Those are incredible statistics. And New York and New Jersey are imposing incredible, incredibly um, uh, harsh restrictions and requirements. Other states, even Nebraska, Vermont, New Hampshire, you know, they closed ice rinks and, and such and uh, have imposed other restrictions. So people are keenly aware of this. There will be a lot of sort of um, uh, rep informal reporting and we'll take any action that's appropriate. Last question for you, Governor. I know you addressed it generally earlier, but on winter sports, high school scholastic sports, are you advising anyone or the MPA or other organizations about what to do in terms of backup plans or contingency plans through this week and into next month uh, as these cases continue to trend upward? So I'll begin, then Governor, you can jump in. So winter sports haven't yet begun. The Maine Principals Association announced a delay to the start of the season. So that is where we are. We are rapidly trying to align community sports with school sports to make sure that there's no, no gap. But should we see a problem of transmission, we will investigate on a case-by-case -case basis and then consider changes to our guidance. But Governor, I'm not sure if you have anything to add to that. No, that, that seems to, that, I think that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you. Final question for the afternoon goes to Patrick from the AP. Thank you very much uh, to you all. Um, a couple things. Um, I would love to know just a little bit more about the Keeping Maine Healthy grant program uh, in terms of uh, how much uh, how much money is going to be available this time around, when it will be available, and um, and what it could be uh, what it could be used for. Uh, I know you. Governor Mills, you touched on this earlier. I just wanted to know a little bit more about that. And um, also, uh, is there more to be said about uh, the coming holidays and how the state might approach that? Because it, it sounds like there are some concerns that uh, that could uh, lead to more spread and the state would like to avoid that. Sure. I'll begin by talking about the Key Main Healthy Program. Maybe the governor can talk about the holidays. But uh, we extended the program that we announced early in June, actually, that would support municipalities. There are 132 plus some tribes that have been participating in this program. They submitted budgets. We have been working with them on their budgets. Uh, not all of them spent all the amount that they applied for. So what the extension is doing is allowing them to continue to draw down on the amount that we allocated. So $13 million was the amount that Governor Mills uh, provided for this program from the Coronavirus Relief Fund, a federal funding source. And what we've been doing is extending those programs to, again, help with lo local education, local newsletters, local health officials visiting different establishments to provide on-site education, really providing the kind of tailored local education and help in enforcement that has been instrumental in helping to keep Maine safe. And uh, Patrick, on the holidays, you know, I'll start and yeah, please. wants to uh, chime in as well. You know, we're still three and a half, three and a half weeks out from, say, Thanksgiving. So there is still time uh, across the state to get a lid on. Things. But 
we also believe that this is a good opportunity to remind folks, as we were just mentioning with, uh, with, with David, to remind folks that as we go into colder months with higher rates of disease, even things like family gatherings can pose a risk of COVID-19. Even the storied traditional Thanksgiving gathering that so many of us look forward to, and this year could be an opportunity for a COVID-19 transmission event. So we're, we're taking the opportunity now to talk about it and remind everyone that we've got an opportunity to get a lid on things, but also remind them that got to make sure they're doing the things to keep them and their families safe. But Governor, um, Patrick's question was the last one, so I'll turn things back over to you for holidays as well as anything to close us out this afternoon. Thank you. I have nothing more to say about holidays, but I know that one of the reasons we're doing what we're doing, the reasons we're taking the actions we're taking now is to keep people safe for the holidays, keep people safe for the coming weeks and months, whatever their activities may be. You know, we, we talked about masks earlier. People were asking about masks, what kind of masks is, is good. I, I'm someone who wears glasses from time to time or to see long distance away. I find that the masks with the metal inserts that cover your nose, that those keep your glasses from fogging up. Just a, just an observation on my part, um, much easier to, uh, to wear. Um, it, it saddens me to see what's happening in Massachusetts. And we're keeping an eye on those, those statistics in other, in other states every day. Uh, tomorrow's election day. And I just want to, first of all, say kudos to certain folks who've been so helpful. Kudos to um, Anheuser-Busch, which is uh, supplying hand sanitizer to poll workers. Kudos to L.L. Bean and Flowfold, who are supplying masks to poll workers and clerks across the state. Kudos to Su Central Southern Maine Community Center, Community College, and Dan Abbott, the great engineer who designed drop boxes and kudos to main source machining of West Newfield who manufactured drop boxes to be that are distributed all across the state. And that has made Maine people safer in exercising their fundamental right to vote. And kudos to those who are running for office and who've had to adapt uh, in these crazy times to campaigning without going door to door, without exposing other people. Uh, and, and endangering other people, campaigning in new different ways, whether they're running for sheriff or county commissioner or select person or US senator or president. Um, and uh, for those people who are gonna be planning success or failure tomorrow evening or later on in the week uh, at, after the polls closed, traditionally there are parties and celebrations I would ordinarily be looking forward to stopping in a number of parties and celebrations across the state. I'm not gonna be doing that. I'll be staying put, watching things on TV, watching um, Facebook Live presentations by different uh, election uh, campaign people. Um, it's part of what we're giving up because we all want people to stay safe. Not going to parties, not going to celebrations, not toasting things. Uh, wearing masks when we go out for any reason, and um, <clears throat> and uh, working remotely if we still can. And I would encourage employers who are uh, who, who are able to let their employees work remotely. I think in this particular time, with the statistics this last week, that is an entirely appropriate, a reasonable, recommended thing to do. Let your people work remotely. Um, and I wanna keep in mind above all, the 1,189 healthcare workers who have been diagnosed with COVID-19 in the last few months. Let's remember whether you or your son or daughter or your family member or friend goes to a gathering, whether it's at a, a church or political meeting or a workplace meeting, some other thing, they may not feel symptoms, they may not feel sick, but they may transmit that virus to their son or daughter, who takes it to their school, who takes it to their grandparents' uh, residence, apartment, and it spreads so quickly in such an insidious and deadly manner that when you encounter that person, that secondary spread that we're seeing now is just as insidious as you seeing the person with COVID and coming down with it yourself. So please be careful out there. Please take care of yourselves and think about the healthcare workers. If we, if we get over capacity in our ICUs, which can happen very suddenly, very quickly, 
um, then when, if and when you get sick, you won't have the help to take, take care of you and your loved ones. We won't have the people to take care of you. Please think about that every day and stay safe. Do the right thing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Governor. Thank you all for joining this afternoon. We'll talk again soon.